Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We welcome you to this Elder Justice Initiative webinar, Law Enforcement Investigation of Financial Exploitation. As with uh, any technology, we may at some point experience a momentary lapse in the webinar session. In the event of such problems, please be patient, remain with us, and the webinar should resume shortly. I do want to take a moment to see that everyone is connected. So if you are experiencing a technical problem, please type a private chat message to the technical specialist, Danielle, in the chat box on the lower right. If you cannot access the chat, you can also send Danielle an email at dmclean at ovctech.org. If you have questions that come up throughout the webinar, we invite you to use our chat box to ask those questions. We'll be taking some time throughout and at the end of the webinar to address as many questions as possible. We do want to note that today's session is being recorded. It will be made available on the OVC TTAC training website and also the Elder Justice website. So at this time, I'm going to turn things over to our host, Yolanda Campbell, a trial attorney at the Department of Justice in the Elder Justice Initiative. <coughs> Yolanda. Thank you. Uh, everyone, welcome today uh, to the webinar. Um, we're glad that we're able to provide this uh, training for you you find it um, informative and helpful in your day-to-day um, -day, uh, duties. Um, <clears throat> just a, a quick recap, um, the Elder Justice Initiative um, promotes uh, justice for older adults, helps older victims and their families, enhances state and local efforts through training and resources, and supports organizing and presenting research to improve elder abuse policy and practice. Uh, we have implemented and launched our elderjustice.gov webpage, and hopefully a lot of you have already gone and seen the web page, but in case you haven't, uh, here's a screenshot um, of the website. And the website uh, provides a lot of useful information about the initiative and some additional resources related to elder abuse. Um, in particular, for today's presentation, I just wanted to highlight that there um, is a section in, on the website that relates specifically to law enforcement. Um, you can see it there on the left side of, of the screenshot. Um, and if you click on that, uh, when you go to the website and you click on that law enforcement section, there's a, there's a ton of different resources, including some that are uh, a couple uh, like PDF uh, training materials uh, related to uh, financial exploitation. And then in addition, we have, as you can see here, um, a section uh, specifically dedicated to financial exploitation in general. So today we are really fortunate to have two very great speakers uh, to talk to you about uh, the role of law enforcement in uh, financial exploitation elder abuse cases. Um, our first presenter today is Karen Weber. She's a forensic accountant. Uh, she's a certified public accountant and certified fraud examiner in Rochester, New York. Uh, she and her staff at Weber CPA serve 22 multidisciplinary teams across New York State and have a real passion for their work in elder abuse intervention. And then we also have uh, speaking with us today Detective Nicole Ann Frudel, who has been with the Seattle Police Department for 16 years. She has spent 10 of those years in patrol, four years in the domestic violence unit, and one year with the elder vulnerable adult abuse. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to these amazing uh, subject matter experts to provide you with information that you're here for today. Karen? Great. Thank you, Yolanda. Can everyone hear me? Yep. I'm so honored to be asked to share my perspective today is we talk about our work investigating financial exploitation cases. Um, as Yolanda just told you, I am a community-based forensic accountant who serves all of the New York State multidisciplinary teams, or MDPs. And I say community-based because the role of forensic accountants differs depending on whether we work in the private sector, like I do, or in a government agency, such as a police department or district attorney's office. The work of a forensic accountant employed by law enforcement is limited to active criminal investigations 
while the work of a private sector or community-based forensic accountant is not. And that's an important distinction because sometimes the financial exploitation cases that come to our team do not yet or will never involve law enforcement. So without access to law enforcement forensic accountants, if they even exist in the first place, the MDT has to come up with other solutions for intervention, and that's where a community-based forensic accountant steps in. And the evidence that we produce can assist with making a criminal referral, supporting a guardianship petition, or most importantly, helping the victim understand the nature and scope of the abuse. You know, so many times we have victims who are unwilling to recognize that financial exploitation or mismanagement is occurring. And they'll say, well, yeah, you know, I've given my niece $100 here and there. But when they read the forensic accounting report and realize that that $100 here and there actually added up to 30 grand over the past couple years, their thoughts on pressing charges or receiving other assistance might change. You know, maybe this kind of case never rises to the level of a criminal investigation, but based on the forensic accounting report and the victim's cooperation, we might revoke a POA, appoint a guardian, or set the elderly person up with some sort of financial management service. Financial exploitation has many different formal definitions, but on our teams up here in New York, we generally follow the definition provided under our social services law, which states that financial exploitation is the improper use of an adult's funds, property, or resources by another individual. That's including, but not limited to fraud, false pretenses, embezzlement, conspiracy, forgery, falsifying records, coerced property transfers, or denial of access to assets. In the field, financial exploitation commonly looks like this. Extortion, which is threatening harm if the victim doesn't turn over assets or other resources. Unexplained disappearance of funds or valuables. Inappropriate use of a victim's phone, food, or other resources. Transfers of real property. Transfers of other types of assets or valuables. Um, a caregiver who refuses to use an elderly person's funds for their care misuse of an elderly person's home, identity theft, which Nicole will talk about later, and scams, which are so, so common, um, as you all know. This next slide I call the four Cs, they are really like the big issues that surround financial exploitation, um, especially of the elderly and vulnerable adults. Uh, criminal versus civil, understanding that there's a civil and criminal side to these cases. Capacity determination, complexity, you know, all the moving parts that are at play here. Um, and finally, the lack of cooperation that often occurs between many agencies that become involved in these cases in their different capacities. One of the greatest challenges we face in this field is that a huge number of cases go unremitied because the victims don't report. As many of you probably know, in 2011, Lifespan of Greater Rochester, Wild Cornell Medical Center, and the New York City Department for the Aging published a study called Under the Radar, New York State Elder Abuse Prevalence Study. And that found that for every case of elder abuse that's reported to a responsible agency, 23 others go unreported. And the response that the brave victims who actually did report sometimes got is, you know, well, this is just a civil matter, especially if the complaint involved a dispute between family members or it surrounded a power of attorney. Elder abuse, including financial exploitation, can be both civil and criminal. Here in New York, our power of attorney abuse is covered on, on the civil side by general obligations law. And the financial abuse in general, whether perpetrated by the power of attorney or other party, on the criminal side is covered under our larceny and welfare endangerment statutes. And I've included links to those if you are interested. The next challenge we face is understanding and determining capacity. Capacity, as we know, is a moving target and the geriatric physicians and psychiatrists on our team have taught us that assessments of a victim's capacity can differ based on who's doing the assessment, the type and stage of dementia, recent life events, especially traumatic ones like moving to a new home or facility, the death of a loved one, all of these things can affect how a person presents and makes decisions. Um, also location, time of day, others in the room can affect the results of a capacity assessment as can prescribed medications, diets, and nutrition. To further complicate the issue, an elderly person can be deemed capable of making certain decisions, but not others. So navigating capacity makes the additions of geriatricians and geriatric psychiatrists to multidisciplinary teams so critical. 
Another problem we encounter investigating these cases is the complexity of a victim's financial picture, which varies, as we know, from victim to victim. They may have multiple bank or investment accounts at multiple financial institutions, and money is constantly moving back and forth between them. We can't just add up all the withdrawals in all of the accounts and say that's how much money is missing, because some funds that were removed could have been deposited into another account and spent from there, leading us to double count it. And double counting withdrawals may cause us to bring an inappropriate charge against our suspected perpetrator. If the victim doesn't know how long the exploitation has been occurring, where do you even start looking? If we know when the suspected perpetrator entered the picture, I generally recommend requesting financial records beginning six months prior. These six months prior show us a pattern of the victim's spending before the perpetrator entered the picture, providing us a basis for recognizing deviations after the abuse began. If we don't know how long the perpetrator has been involved or the relationship has been going on a long time, I typically start by requesting two years back and then attempt to find some patterns within those specific records. If we have to go back further, we can, depending on the statute of limitations or other factors discussed by the MDT. Cases are further complicated when the suspected perpetrator and the victim share resources, commingle funds, if you will, and when the victim's spending patterns aren't easily observable in the records, you know, or multiple perpetrators are suspected. For all these reasons, financial exploitation cases require a significant investment of time and attention to detail to effectively investigate. Cooperation between involved agencies, as the MDT model shows us, is the best solution to financial exploitation cases involving the elderly and vulnerable adults because without MDTs, we've got multiple agencies working in silos. Law enforcement investigators are investigating and gaining their information, and APS is involved, and they've got different information. Then you've got the doctor who's got additional information that he learned directly from the victim, and so on. Under the MDT model, all of these players come together around one table so that everyone working on the case has the best available information for decision making. And under this model, intervention is now a coordinated effort that's efficient and effective. With or without an MDT in your community, how do you effectively investigate financial exploitation? Well, a great place to start is by finding some determination of capacity for the victim if you can. In the best case scenario, that determination comes from a geriatric psychiatrist who performs a psychiatric evaluation on your victim on some date and the written evaluation they produce makes specific reference to the victim's capacity for financial decision making. Not just decision making in general, but specifically financial decision making. Even better, if you can find additional evidence that the suspected perpetrator was aware of this evaluation or this assessment while the abuse was occurring. If you don't have or you can't get a formal evaluation, Alternative pieces of evidence include doctor's notes that might indicate memory problems, a dementia diagnosis, troubles with decision making, et cetera. Um, perhaps an attorney recently refused to prepare a POA for the victim because maybe he or she didn't believe that they could make the decision at that time. Or perhaps your suspect has mentioned at some point the victim's trouble with normal household activities like paying bills. You know, any sort of information you can get about the suspect's awareness of the victim's capacity before or during the abuse will help you prosecute your case. A power of attorney document, if it exists, is another powerful tool in an elder abuse case. When you're reviewing the document, it's important to make sure or to make note of not only the principal, the agent, the co-agent if there is one, the monitor if there is one, but also the date that it was executed. Was it executed before or after the suspect was aware of the capacity issues? Um, also, you want to look at the specific powers that the document grants. Um, in New York State, there's this long list of powers that the principal, um, who would be the victim in your case, must individually initial in order to grant the agent, um, who might sometimes be the suspected perpetrator, the power to conduct certain financial transactions. Those could be banking transactions, real estate transactions, etc. There's also space in that list where the victim can initial just once and grant all of those other powers listed. So if the specific power to conduct a certain transaction isn't granted under the power of attorney, but the suspect conducted the transaction anyway, you have evidence of exploitation. The gift writer 
In New York State, our power of attorney documents may contain what's called a statutory gift rider, the SGR, which allows the agent to make gifts on behalf of the principal in excess of the $500 limit under our general obligations law. So if the rider doesn't exist, the agent can gift no more than a total of $500 in aggregate to other individuals, including the agent. If your victim or suspected perpetrator produces a power of attorney document for you, you'll want to compare it with copies on file at the bank or at the county clerk's office. Um, if the victim or perp can't produce the power of attorney document, a bank or county clerk's office is a good place to try to look for one if it has been filed at either place. You should also try asking whether a prior power of attorney existed, who was named as the agent in that document, and when and why was it changed knowledge like this will better inform your investigation. Medical records are also really important to your case. As we discussed earlier, medications that the victim is taking or not taking, but should be, might affect the victim's memory and presentation from day to day. So medical records could also show dates of hospitalization if there were any. And if you can pinpoint transactions in the bank data that took place while the victim was hospitalized, that will strengthen your case too because clearly if they were in a hospital bed, they're not withdrawing cash at that ATM 16 miles away. Medical records might also give you some indication about the victim's capacity, like we talked about earlier, um, as the doctor noted during his or her visits. I mean, also whether the suspected perpetrator was present at any of the appointments. You know, doctors will make notes and say, um, daughter was present or son was present, et cetera. So if the suspected perpetrator was present at any of those appointments where capacity or decision-making ability may have been discussed, that's important information you'll want to include in your report. Finally, as we all know, bank statements are the real meat of any financial exploitation investigation. But whether it's a bank or a credit union or an investment account, the monthly statements alone aren't enough to fully investigate a case. When you request bank records, make sure your request specifically includes account opening and ownership change documents. These documents will provide a sample of the victim's signature, tell you when the account was opened, and whether another individual, like a power of attorney, may have been added to the account, either as a joint owner, an authorized user, or a beneficiary. Copies of deposit items. This means a copy of every single check that got deposited to your victim's account and every deposit slip that went along with it, which would indicate if cash was deposited, if checks were deposited, um, and any cash back requested as part of that transaction. Copies of checks deposited are really important for helping identify other assets the victims might have that you may not previously be aware of. These could be accounts that were liquidated and consolidated to the account you're currently looking at, or accounts that may still exist and you'll want to request. You might see in the deposit items reverse mortgage proceeds or proceeds from the sale of real property, insurance proceeds for policies that were cashed out, um, or even proceeds that came um, from claims of missing valuables. We had a case up here recently where you know, we went through the deposit items and we found this $50,000 check and the memo line of the check that was deposited said um, for jewelry, it was from an insurance company, so not only was this victim missing $50,000 worth of jewelry, the insurance proceeds were deposited to the account and ultimately spent. Next is copies of withdrawal items. This means a copy of every withdrawal slip that took place, every withdrawal that took place, there's a withdrawal slip that goes with it. And this withdrawal slip will indicate how much was withdrawn, on what date, whether it was withdrawn as cash or as a cashier's check, and who signed for it. The signatures on these slips make it really easy to attribute the withdrawal to either the victim or the suspected perp. And copies of the cashier's checks obviously will show where those certified funds specifically went. Copies of canceled checks, hugely important, both the front and the back. You know, bank statements simply show that a check was cashed on a certain date for a certain amount, like on March 7th, check number 109 for $300. That's typically what your bank statement says. They don't show any details about who the check was made out to, so we want to see the checks themselves. The front of a check will give us clues in the form of handwriting, payee instructions, signatures, um, and memo details. The back gives us clues in the forms of the endorsement or the signature stamp of the payee, 
the bank where the funds may have been deposited, and in some cases, the very account number where those funds were deposited. So this kind of information on the back of the check helps us identify other accounts owned either by the victim or by the suspect. So we can go on and request additional records. Obviously, this is where a huge amount of time comes in because the new accounts that we find, we've got to go back and request. Um, it can be a very lengthy process. Uh, finally, transfer details are also necessary for a thorough investigation. Bank statements themselves may show that a transfer occurred, but not necessarily where the money went. So transfer details are records that the bank keeps, which show both the origin or destination bank and the account number. And that assists us, again, with identifying additional assets or accounts to request. And then records from the additional accounts, once we receive them, help us see exactly how the victim's funds were ultimately used whether they were used for the victim's benefit or for someone else's. Locating bank accounts can be challenging, especially when victims are no longer aware of where they bank or even how much money they have. If the victim can provide a copy of even one bank statement, start there. Um, in the deposit section, you might look for outside deposits or transfers in. And then in the withdrawal section, check for transfers, transfers out. Uh, as we discussed on the previous slide, when you're requesting statements from a financial institution, you know, you'll ask them for details on these deposits and transfers. And then you'll get that information when your request comes back. If the victim can provide copies of prior year's tax returns, that's super helpful. You can flip to a form in the tax return called Schedule B, if it exists. It will list any financial institutions where the victim earned interest on their deposits. So if the victims earned interest on you know, a savings account, even a checking account in some cases, they have to report that interest on their tax return and Schedule B lists out every bank. And so then you can go ahead and request records from those banks. Other tips I've taken from APS over the years, check WMS or APS can, that's the welfare management system, to see where social security payments are directed, since all social security payments have to be direct deposited they'll be able to tell you what bank, what account it's going to. Um, you can also check with utility companies to see what bank the victim's checks or automatic payments are drawn on. That's very helpful if you don't know where to start. Um, and then the other thing is APS a lot of times will just send blanket letters to the largest financial institutions in the area and see if they get anything back. Um, if you are APS or law enforcement, obviously you have the power to request bank records. And when you do so, I recommend leaving off specific account numbers, even if you know them. Because if you request a specific account number, the only records you're going to get back are for that specific account. And similarly, if you request accounts for Mrs. Smith, you're only going to get Mrs. Smith's individual accounts, not the joint accounts that she might hold with her spouse or joint accounts she may own with a suspected perpetrator. So to avoid missing this information, I just encourage law enforcement, APS, um, you know, agents in some cases, to include language in their request which states something like, any and all accounts held individually and jointly by Mrs. Smith. This any and all accounts piece kind of acts as a catch-all for the non-depository accounts like loans, lines of credit, et cetera, that the victim might hold in addition to their regular checking and savings accounts. When my staff and I dig into the records and start conducting our investigation, these are kind of the steps that we work with. We try to first establish a timeline that details all those things we talked about earlier. When a POA was signed, when capacity was deemed impaired or first appeared so, when the suspect entered the victim's life, any date hospitalized, all those pieces. And from there, we start summarizing the banking activity. We list all the cash inflows by their source and all their outflows by their type or use. Um, and we use Microsoft Excel for that. If we, or the statement reading software that we have, captured everything correctly, the opening statement balance, balances and ending statement balances will reconcile to those balances shown on the bank statement. That's a good check. We may look at the inflows and outflows by month or by year, whichever makes the most sense for that specific case. And then based on the patterns um, that we observe, you know, make note of those patterns and the deviations. At that point, we can compare any patterns and deviations to our timeline 
and then prepare a written report or a narrative that tells the story of what happened, how much was taken, who took it, how did they do it. Um, and then all the Excel schedules that we use to analyze these patterns are attached to the back of our written report to support the written findings. But the facts contained in the narrative, despite the numbers in the back, are really what the jury can more easily, or a jury, more easily read and understand. I should note, because I get asked this all the time, you know, professional ethics prevent forensic accountants from giving an opinion on guilt or innocence. You know, we can't stand up there on the stand and say, um, you know, so-and-so is guilty of financial exploitation. You know, I tell everyone our reports are just the facts, ma'am, kind of thing. However, we can arrange the facts that we have in such a way that a reasonable reader would come to the intended conclusion on their own. And that's really important. So if you are preparing a written narrative, think about that. You cannot say guilty or innocent, but you can arrange the facts in such a way. So with that, um, if you'd like to locate a forensic accountant in your area, you can start a few places. Your state board of accountancy maintains a list of all active CPAs in your state. You can check out the CPA Verify link right here in the webinar to search for a CPA. You can also go straight to your state's Society of CPAs, which is a professional organization specifically for CPAs practicing within your state. Um, alternatively, the AICPA is a national CPA professional organization, and that maintain, they maintain a credential called Certified in Financial Forensics, the CFF. So you could search for CPAs who hold the CFF designation as well using that Find a CPA link I included on this slide. And then finally, the ACFE is another great place to start. That is the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Their website maintains a list of CFEs near you, and then you can narrow your search down by CP CFEs who are also CPAs, and hopefully find a forensic account that might be interested in helping you out. And of course, you can always call me, and I can help point you in the right direction. Um, I really appreciate you guys tuning in today. Thanks so much for letting me share all of this with you. I hope that it was helpful. And I guess that means it's my turn. Good, uh, I think it's uh, East Coast time. It's good afternoon. And for those of us on the West Coast, good morning. My name is Detective Nicole Fertel, and I am with the Seattle Police Department Elder and Vulnerable Adult Unit. Um, as uh, Yolanda mentioned in the introduction, I've been with the Elder Abuse Unit for about a year, and it's been an amazing education. Um, I dearly wish I'd had access to this webinar about a year ago. It would have come in really handy. Um, let me go ahead and jump in here. So what I wanted to talk about today was just sort of an overview of how I investigate financial exploitation cases. What is financial exploitation? What is a vulnerable adult? What makes victims vulnerable to exploitation? Where do the cases come from? Typical workup, and sending the case to prosecutor for charges. I know that Karen did uh, some of this. We do have some overlap, uh, so I will try and mitigate that as best I can. Here in Washington State, we have our own definition of what financial exploitation is. Um, what it boils down to is basically somebody getting their hands on an individual's assets uh, for their own use, not for the benefit of the individual. Um, they can do this in any number of ways. Uh, I like to think of them as you know, predators looking for that, that weak member of society. They're looking for folks who are isolated, who don't have family nearby, or maybe not the mobility or ability to get out and about. Um, they're going to use whatever tactic offers the best chance at success. And success is defined by gaining access to their stuff. Uh, so as, as police officers, I know a great many of us have been to that um, house on the block where grandma lives and maybe allowed grandson to come and stay with her. And the next thing you know, that is the trouble address on your block. Um, they're gaining access to the homes, the cars, the phone, the food, other resources. 
sometimes they're doing things like transferring real property, um, quick claim deeding houses to themselves, uh, gaining access to other assets, cars, guns, whatever the whatever it might be. Um, and then refusing to use the victim's funds for their own essential needs and services. Let me moving forward. Uh, they do this, again, in a variety of ways um, through the use of deception, intimidation, undue influence. Uh, you know, this, this is that case of um, the friendly neighbor who uh, hears that Lois is home alone and, and isn't getting out and, you know, maybe, maybe develops that relationship, moves in uh, and starts it's almost like a it's almost like a um, a romance of the individual. They become everything that person needs, and uh, gains access to their their trust. Uh, you know, they tell them your family doesn't care about you. I'm the one here for you. I'm the one who's going to look out for you and make sure you have what you need. Um, sometimes it's it's more scary. It's the intimidation. Boy, I, I sure don't like it when Molly gets mad and starts shouting at me. I'm just going to go ahead and give her, you know, a hundred bucks so that so that she doesn't get angry at me. Um, we're talking about breaches of fiduciary duty, the power of attorney that Karen had mentioned. I don't know if you are aware of this, but you could go online right now and type in power of attorney and come up with a contract uh, that you could print out and uh, you know present to somebody and have them sign their rights away. It's scary how easy it is for folks to get their hands on one of these. And uh, you know, the rule would be before somebody signs a power of attorney document, they need to have the capacity to do so. Um, these predators aren't going to care about capacity. They're going to schmooze through it and try and gain access any way they can. Uh, I recently had a case filed where uh, grandma had had a stroke and was in hospital. A uh, son arranged for a lawyer to come and make him the power of attorney. The lawyer went to the hospital room, did a very simple cognitive assessment with the elderly lady, and said, boy, you know, this isn't a good time to try and do this. Uh, we can try doing this another time. Um, the son didn't like that answer, and a couple of weeks later, he brought in somebody else, a, a notary public, who was under no obligation to do any sort of cognitive testing, and uh, said, OK, are you Alice? Yes, I'm Alice. OK, well, Alice, do you know what you're signing? Yep, I sure do. OK. And you know, uh, the son got access to all of his mom's assets, and uh, shenanigans ensued. All right. And then there's a key, a key element here is uh, the subject knows or should know that the vulnerable adult lacks the capacity to consent. OK, so what is a vulnerable adult? Here in the state of Washington, it's somebody 60 years of age or older who has the functional, mental, or physical inability to care for him or herself. I have a presentation buddy uh, who is 63 years old. And she can still walk, talk, and chew gum. Right? She would, although she's over 60, she is not vulnerable by any means. Uh, she can do everything that she needs to do for herself. On the other hand, my 73-year-old mother is confined to a wheelchair. She requires assistance with all of her activities of daily living. She is the walking, well, she's not walking, uh, talking poster girl for a vulnerable adult because she can't get out. She is isolated. Um, and, and uh, given certain medical conditions, doesn't always have the capacity to make good choices when it comes to her finances. So it's a fortunate thing that uh, we have other things in place to, to help keep her safe that way. Um, other definitions for a vulnerable adult. So somebody who's been found to be incapacitated for some reason. I recently had a case where um, a gentleman was under 60, but his uh, long-term use of alcohol had basically damaged him so badly that he was um, designated by the court as an incapacitated person, and a guardian was appointed. Uh, somebody who's over the age of 18 and has developmental disabilities, 
unfortunately, we get a lot of case with these folks because they make fantastic victims. Um, anybody who's been admitted to a licensed long-term care facility, uh, any person who's receiving services from a licensed home health hospice or home care agency. So those are who your vulnerable adults are. But what makes people vulnerable? Uh, really one of the greatest causes is dementia. It's an acquired, usually progressive condition characterized by decreases in short-term memory, decreases in judgment, language, math, reading, or writing skills, employment skills, social skills, ability to care for themselves. Something that really struck me several years ago when I did it, um, when I went to a training, they talked about the fact that dementia is not a natural part of aging. You know, you could be 100 years old and sharp as a tack. Um, if somebody is suffering from dementia, if they're having cognitive decline, there's a reason. There's some sort of process at work that's causing them to have that difficulty. So don't assume just because somebody's older uh, that having memory issues and dementia is just part of it. That's not the case. All right. Oh, and then this is that call we've all been dispatched to about the old person who's wandered away from their adult family home and can't find their way back. So other causes of vulnerability. Um, the picture on the slide here, my version has a little caption that reads, uh, this is the most dangerous animal in the world. It's responsible for millions of deaths every year. And by its side, a great white shark swims peacefully. Uh, the reason I put this slide up is because I think of these predators like sharks. They can smell the vulner vulnerability coming off of some people. Um, folks become vulnerable to predation for a variety of reasons. It could be due to a lack of bandwidth, due to grief or depression, loneliness, isolation, drug addiction, etc. The predator's going to supply whatever their potential victim needs, at least for a little while through that romance. All right. So here in the domestic violence unit, thefts, or excuse me, the elder abuse unit, thefts are really our bread and butter. Um, we're looking at cases where somebody wrongfully obtained uh, through uh, the color and aid of deception the property of another. So I mentioned previously about uh, my, my uh, vulnerable adult who had had a stroke, Mary had a stroke, went into a skilled nursing facility, and her granddaughter, Allison, stepped up to take care of grandma's bills while she was incapacitated. Allison had herself designated as Mary's durable power of attorney. Again, the question is, did Mary have the capacity to sign the document? Mm, definitely arguable. Allison, once she had that DOA, DPOA paperwork in place, uh, over the course of 18 months, she transferred $570,000 from grandma's different assets and investment accounts uh, into her own bank account and uh, basically spent it all on gambling. Um, this was a very clear case. Uh, what Karen said about looking at the bank records, I mean, you could just, you could just see it going out. It was very clear. and. Uh, when she was confronted with charges on this case, she pled guilty. So that was really exciting. She, um, the, the suspect in this case, Miss Allison, had no criminal history. And she pled for uh, her plea agreement was going to give her three, three years of prison time. So they can be uh, very rewarding in terms of what you can get if you can pull all the pieces together. Uh, identity thefts, I've had one case so far that really dealt with identity theft issues. Basically, uh, this is where a suspect knowingly obtains or possesses a means of identification or financial information of another person with the intent to commit a crime or obtain credit, money, goods, services, or anything else of value. So in this case that I had, Grandma Beatrice lived at home uh, on her own but with the assistance of various family members. 
she suffered a stroke, and this resulted in very obvious cognitive impairment. Um, granddaughter Michelle stepped up to assist her and became her durable power of attorney. Uh, Michelle got savvy that somebody in the family may have stolen Grandma B's identity because she saw that Grandma was receiving lots of credit cards, uh, credit card offers and credit cards in the mail. Um, and she thought that her cousin Dana might have been diverting the credit cards for her own use. Um, we were never able to link cousin Dana to the crime. In the course of my investigation, I actually found that granddaughter Michelle had taken over $20,000 from grandma over the course of 18 months to pay for her rent and put her kids in camp, et cetera. So um, you never know what you're going to find sometimes when you scratch the surface. All right, where do we get our cases from? Some of our cases come from patrol. Uh, I recently received an excellent report uh, from one of our officers who'd responded to a call at a 7-Eleven where an elderly man was trying to purchase $2,500 worth of gift cards for a friend. Uh, he did a great job on the report. He tried to establish a rapport with this individual and find out more information. Um, this particular individual, Ben, he's really vulnerable. Um, and I think he has been, uh, what's the right word? He has been um, trained by whoever's handling him not to cooperate with po uh, police officers. Uh, we're still working on this case, trying to figure out what money has been going out and uh, who the suspects might be. But um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting case that came from patrol. Uh, we had another case recently where officers went to do a welfare check on a woman who had called her broker desperate to withdraw money from an IRA. Um, the brokerage agent could hear what sounded like a uh, DV situation in the background. And uh, the responding officers did a great job of separating the parties and trying to find out what the situation is so that we could look into it and get a sense of what was going on. Ultimately, that case was not, um, the victim in that case was not a vulnerable adult. She has not been so designated by the court, although she does suffer from bipolar disorder and her father is attempting to become her guardian because uh, this boyfriend is uh, taking her for all the money she has. Uh, the main way we get cases is from APS. There's a low bar for reporting concerns because they want anyone to uh, have access to raise concerns. Um, it, it, it's sort of like that if you see something, say something. Go ahead, give us a call, let us know what's going on. APS will then do a criminal investigation request to us. And then we, we run independent investigations, but there is overlap, and we do like to work together when possible. All right. So in a typical case workup, um, and again, Karen went over this in, in her presentation, so I'm just going to go over it kind of quickly. You need to determine what the nature of the allegation is. Uh, are there any health or safety threats? Is there any need to stabilize or protect the alleged victim from further abuse or exploitation? Uh, I have a case right now where grandson was going to grandma's retirement home on a nearly daily basis and asking her for money. Um, this guy is a well-known North End criminal uh, who has been handled by probably every member of patrol up in the North Precinct. Uh, and so we figured out pretty quickly that we needed to keep him away from grandma because she was going to give him anything that he wanted. And we were able to go out and get what's known as a vulnerable adult protection order uh, that makes it a criminal act for him to come within 1,000 feet of her. So hopefully that is going to slow down that situation and uh, allow us to, to take care of grandma and, and make sure that she's not vulnerable to future exploitation. Let's see. 
uh, I like to contact the reporting party, uh, whether it be the person who called 911 initially or the person who made the referral to the Adult Protective Service. Uh, what brought the situation to their attention? What sort of evidence of wrongdoing can they provide? Um, the hospital social workers are amazing. Uh, we've all encountered HIPAA and um, the bars to getting information from hospitals that might be useful to us in cases that we're investigating. Uh, the social worker is frequently able to give us some good information about what's going on um, in these vulnerable adult situations. Um, Caregivers are a great source of information, the ones that aren't doing the exploitation themselves. They know about who might be the durable power of attorney. They might have contact information for family members, et cetera, um, bank employees. They can be amazing. They can give us screenshots of whatever questionable activity might be going on uh, and, and, and give us information about their own investigations. And then querying the different players, you know, looking into the criminal histories. Uh, are there any previously reported incidents of financial exploitation or domestic violence in the relationship between the individuals that you've got? Has the suspect previously been arrested or convicted for theft crimes? Is, the, is there any drug history which might explain why the grandson keeps pestering grandma for money? Um, so this can be a really great way of providing a window into patterns and practice of conduct uh, that are going to be really important in the presentation of our case to the prosecutor. It also gives us baseline for the onset of the victim's vulnerability and sort of the scope and nature of the problem. Next comes the initial face-to-face -face interview with the victim. Our prosecutors prefer us to videotape the interview whenever possible. Um, this is a great way to preserve the condition of the alleged victim at the time that the theft was discovered and reported to law enforcement. And it can be a powerful statement. Um, if, if the victim is on board and wants to and, and, and is able to really describe how this exploitation has impacted them in their lives. Uh, I talked earlier about the case with the woman who had had the $570,000 stolen from her accounts. She was in a lovely nursing home. Um, and I know that that money dried up and went away as of January of this year. So, you know, what effect is this all having on her at this point? Has she had to move to another facility? Um, what kind of impact has that had on her mental state and her health? Let's see. The competency assessment. We can do a baseline version of this ourselves. Ask your, pa your patient, ask your victim orientation questions. Do they, you know, who, what's their name? What's their birthday? Where are they right now? You know, what's their address? Um, do they know the date? Do they know the time, uh, the season? Who's the president? You know, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Tell me something you did yesterday. It's going to become really clear whether or not um, there's issues in that conversation. Uh, and then there's a variety of assessment tools that might be used to try and pull out some sense of competency. I know that our local Adult Protective Service uses a tool called the MMSC. Um, this is the Mini Mental Status Exam. And it is a tool that can show a snapshot of memory issues at that moment. Um, it's not the best tool for looking into judgment. Uh, and, and this is where you're definitely going to want to find a mental health professional, a doctor who's able to go in and, and do the more rigorous testing if you think that there might be a deficit. Uh, in your interview, you want to talk about all the basics. Uh, what, what is their income, savings, investments? What are they living on? What are their expenses? 
Uh, does the victim pay for his or own, her own bills? Is somebody helping them manage their finances? Has anyone added, or excuse me, has anyone asked the victim to sign documents that he or she doesn't understand? Is there a durable power of attorney, a guardian, a trust? Who is their primary care provider? When the victim knows this can really save you a lot of time and help you out with your investigation. Um, again, I talked about doing things with APS when possible. Here in Washington, the Adult Protective Service Investigator has a certain time frame under which they are required to go and do these interviews with the victim. Um, I like to piggyback on them when possible because I can just sort of get all the information I'm needing and then ask any clarifying questions. It's kind of handy. Let's see, is there anything else on that? No. Again, APS is great about requesting complete medical records from the victim's primary care provider. Uh, we like to get usually the last three years worth. Um, and then I like to talk about consider the need for additional cognitive testing to demonstrate the victim's vulnerability. Uh, this case that I have right now, there was an APS allegation back in April. Uh, the investigator uh, at that time relied on a very brief questionnaire that they give to primary care providers asking uh, about an individual's capacity, but it's a three-question questionnaire. And uh, the doctor answered, sure, she's great, but he hadn't seen her in some period of time. So he didn't know that she had recently declined and was having greater problems. Um, let's see. So here in Washington, we used to have the geriatric regional assessment team. They were amazing, and they were great about going to somebody's home and doing this testing for us. Um, sadly, there has been um, a lack of funding for that particular program, and, and so we're trying to figure out other solutions at this point. Um, if your alleged victim is a, um, is a member of Kaiser Permanente, here in Washington State they have this great program, pilot program that was started last September called the Contour Team, and they do go out and make home visits um, with a social worker, a nurse, and a doctor, and they can do that kind of testing. Um, sometimes it's a matter of looking for local subject matter experts. I had a case with a developmentally disabled adult, um, and she had been born with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. We were able to get her assessed by a local um, practitioner who spe specifically deals with FASD cases, and um, this person was able to write the most amazing letter which I used or which I submitted to the court when I requested a VAPO. Uh, we were able to, to protect that particular victim from the sexual predator that was trying to groom her and separate her from her guardian. All right, and let's see, I need to step it up a little bit here. Um, so again, Karen already talked about obtaining bank records. Uh, we want to go back um, at least six months prior to takings. Suspect interviews. Um, you know, I love talking to suspects. I want to have as much information possible available to me before I do, um, because I want to. I want to know whether they're, what they're telling me is is nonsense or not. But do they have a reasonable explanation for why they transferred sixty thousand dollars out of Grandma's account into their own? Um, did he or she seek legal advice? Did they research best practices? You know, I, I kind of go in like Columbo and, and really encourage them to educate me and help me understand why they did what they did. Um, and then I go back and ask clarifying questions like, uh, you know, okay, so you told me that you had a really good reason for moving the money out of grandma's account because you and the family don't like Chase Bank. That makes sense. Can you tell me about, you know, why you did the quick claim deed? Well, you know about that? Well, sure I do. So. Give me, give me some understanding about that. And uh, it's lovely what you can end up with. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about consulting with your prosecutor. 
again, I've only been doing this for about a, about a year, and I've really found the value in consulting with my prosecutors. I check in early and often uh, because they can help me avoid rabbit holes. Um, I mentioned earlier about scratching the surface and finding all kinds of other things going on. Um, some of that stuff might be actionable. Some of it might not be. Your prosecutor can help you determine what's of greatest value and where to focus your limited attention. And then you want to make sure that your investigation not only supports charging, but the, success, the successful prosecution as well. Um, you know, I've heard people grumble about the prosecutors constantly asking for additional information um, and, and the fact that that can be frustrating. Um, my goal is to get good enough at this job that they don't have to keep asking me for basic stuff, that I'm going to anticipate what their needs are and provide it up front. Um, we, in order to charge, you know, you, you need probable cause, which is less than 51%. Um, they need to charge beyond a reasonable doubt. And so I'm willing to, to spend the extra time getting them what they need so that we can bring the case to court. Uh, all right, let's see. OK. And then fi my final point with regard to working with your prosecutor. If you feel strongly about a case that the prosecutor seems iffy on, be really clear about why you think it needs to be charged. Be able to defend your position. Um, I give an example of a traumatic brain injury in an elderly victim. 77-year-old um, father was knocked to the ground uh, when his 50-year-old son pushed his wife into him. Two days later, dad collapsed and was rushed to the hospital where they found he had a subdural hematoma. Um, there were issues about con causation and intent. Uh, and I was able to find this article done recently by the National Institutes of Health that showed falls in the elderly uh, were a leading cause of traumatic brain injury in adults over 75. And they were willing to charge the case. Um, but if you feel strongly, then definitely uh, fight for the case and, and be really clear about why you think it's important. Let's see. Uh, playing well with others. Don't get siloed. Um, all kinds of different people have good information to share with you when you're trying to, trying to build your case. Like I said, the, so the hospital social workers, APS investigators, um, everywhere in the country there's some version of aging and disability services. They can be a wealth of information. Um, bank fraud investigators, Social Security Office of Inspector General investigators, the AG's office, prosecutor's office. Um, I am all about playing with other people because law enforcement's a team sport, and, and we need to be comfortable with reaching out to them. And that is all that I have. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, my contact information was sort of at the beginning of my presentation. And I want to uh, give you the opportunity to reach out any time that you want and ask any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, so I, I think uh, in the interest of time, since it's scheduled to end at 3, we only really have a minute left. Um, I'm going to advise everyone, if you have questions um, or any comments related to uh, the webinar that we're not, we were not able to address, if you can email them um, to the elder.justice at usdoj.gov website, uh, it would be much appreciated. And we will uh, try to get back to you with um, some substantive answers uh, to any of your questions. Um, we appreciate everyone taking the time today to, to listen in, and we hope that you're able to participate in any additional upcoming webinars um, that we have. And then again, just as a reminder, uh, this webinar was uh, recorded and will be archived, and you can get it on the uh, Elder Justice website as well. Thank you.